Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning. Can anyone hear me? Yes, bro. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, uh, very good morning to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today this morning. Uh, this is our University of Malaya Center of Research sharing session and it is the ninth session uh, that have been conducted for the whole of this year. So this is the second last of the session. And the main um, idea of uh, having this is to encourage interdisciplinary research, which is also one of the biggest challenges um, that we face sometimes. Um, so th the more sessions such as these, the better we get. Uh, therefore, we'll be able to know what other people are doing, right? So um, this event is actually part of the research clusters effort under research visibility pillar. And we hope that by having such sessions, um, we will strengthen the interdisciplinary research within the University of Malaya, right? Um, again, so this session is intended to provide platform for various uh, research center, one to be visible, and the next one, of course, to share the experience. We'd love to hear your experience, uh, your expertise, and the research that you have done. And with this, we hope that we have better collaborations and better research outcomes, right? Um, so basically, there are three aims for this sharing session today. We would like to promote the research center to UM, University of Malaya community, as well as the public. Um, these sessions are being recorded, so we can play it again and again, and people will be able to listen to what your centers have done and the achievements, as well as the challenges that you face, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we also like to enhance knowledge on the role of research centers and sharing of the activities and achievement and building collaboration as well as synergic uh, links opportunities. So for today, we are very grateful and indeed um, to have three uh, renowned speakers. We have Dr. Peter Aning, Anna Atedong, the head for Center for Malaysian Indigenous Studies, CMIS. We also have um, IR Dr. Mas Shahidayana Mukhtar, uh, the head for UM Center for Integrated STEM Exploration, <coughs> UM STEM. And last but not least, we have Prof. Dr. Zurina Osman, the head for Center for Ionics, um, University of Malaya, CIUM. So we'll be hearing from all three distinguished speakers. And um, maybe without further ado, I shall introduce the first speaker for the day. Um, the first speaker is Dr. Peter Aning, Anak Tedong. Um, he's, like I said, this head for Center for Malaysian Indigenous Studies, CMIS. He joined the Department of Urban and Regional Planning at the University of Malaya in December 2014. And um, he, also, he is also the deputy head for, of the Malaysian Population and Migration Research Center at the University of Malaya. He also serves as the head of unit of housing and settlement for the Sustainable Urban and Real Estate Research Center. As urban studies housing scholar, his broad areas of interest cover housing policy and governance, political economy in urban planning and neighborhood sustainability and planning. He has received numerous research grants, both from public and private sector, and recently completed projects explored the socio-spatial planning plans in the context of urban future in Malaysia and the poverty among the indigenous communities in rural areas. So he's both urban as well as rural uh, a renowned figure. He has also carried out work on the role of governance in governing vulnerable pop, uh, communities such as refugees, stateless and foreign workers, and examining various uh, issues related to housing and migration in Malaysian cities. And his latest area of interest is multi-layered governance of affordable housing, the sustainable development goals as DG in relation to neighborhood and community planning, as well as the impacts of migration towards regional and urban development. And his empirical focus is on the Southeast Asia region, but has conducted fieldwork in many countries, Europe, Borneo Islands, North America, and also Oceania countries. Apologies. So over to you, Dr. Peter, all yours. Thank you, Prof. Um, maybe can someone help me share my slide? Because... Okay, hang on. We'll get the All organizers right. to help. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, we can see that. All right. Okay, thank you, uh, Prof, again, and good morning, everyone. Um, I am Dr. Bita Anings, yeah, the, currently the head uh, center for Malaysian Indigenous Studies. 
and if you look at into uh, on the, the 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 left at the top here is our office CMS is located at RKU Rumah Kediaman University number eleven extension sixteen just next to College Science yeah okay thanks next okay yeah before I explain further yeah, about the CM, CMIS, let me briefly talk about the indigenous community in Malaysia. So generally in Malaysia, there are around 15% uh, uh, of indigenous people from the total number of Malaysian populations is quite big as well. Yeah? Uh, they are collectively known yeah, as uh, Orang Asal. So um, just uh, for your information that uh, CMIS not only focus on Orang Asal in Peninsula Malaysia, but we are also looking into indigenous community in Sabah and Sarawak as well. So in Peninsula Malaysia, yeah, uh, indigenous community is also known as Orang Asli, and the Orang Asli comprises around 0.7% of populations in Peninsula Malaysia. The largest uh, indigenous community are come from uh, Sabah and Sarawak. In Sarawak, for instance, um, the indigenous community are known as natives or Daya ataupun Orang Hulu. Yeah? This include, for instance, Iban, Bidayo, Kenyah, Kayan, Punan, uh, Kejaman, Ukit, Sekapan, Melanau, and so on. Yeah? And in Sarawak, uh, they constitute around 70% yeah, of Sarawak populations, uh, of the total Sarawak populations. Yeah? In Sabah, um, there are around 40 different et indigenous ethnic groups, and they are known as Anak Negeri, yeah? and they are marked up around 60% from the uh, Sabah total populations. And the main groups are the Dusun, Murut, Paitan, and Bajau groups. So these are the background of the uh, indigenous community in Malaysia. And this group are also known as uh, underprivileged and marginalized group. Uh, hence, uh, it's very important to include them in this society as we embrace the sustainable demand goal they're promoting the tagline of no one live behind. Yeah. Okay, next. Okay, so just um, quickly on the history and the milestone of the center. Uh, CMI, CMIS was set up uh, in 2004, I think under the Associate Professor of Dr. Rami Bulan, uh, and to coordinate uh, research by various multidisciplinary researcher and support activism on issues affecting indigenous people. So this is when uh, indigenous, the center was established back in 2004. Uh, in December 2018, CMS actually launched a hub yeah, to bridge UM academics with NGOs, activists and artisans coming from various backgrounds, seminar, workshop and culture events. And also CMS launched collaborations with international researcher on project addressing indigenous people in Malaysia and comparative studies with indigenous people from other countries. So actually I was just recently appointed as the head of the center in August, yeah, August this year. So for the past three months, yeah, uh, for the past couple of months after my appointment, uh, I was actually uh, restructured the center by introducing uh, the five main pillars of the center so that to make it the center more diverse, more multidisciplinary, so it will include different background uh, to the center. Okay, now we, we explain about the main pillars like, uh, in shortly. Right, next. No, no, previous slide. Dr. Kita, sorry, you can control the slide by yourself because the uh, organizer giving the access to you. Oh, okay, okay. You just right, uh, right. click uh, next slide. Okay, all right. So, um, all right. So, a way forward from this, yeah. So, what we're gonna to do just to uh for the next coming years is that uh, we aim uh, to become a main hub for indigenous in Malaysia and beyond that promoting knowledge between academic and non-academic institutions, indigenous community and the general public through the following approaches. Uh, CMS believe in multidisciplinary research with indigenous people, community and organization. Second is we will include yeah, uh, indigenous voices in process of research design and implementation. This is very important as this group is 
you know, they are uh, underprivileged group, marginalized group. So we might do slightly different approach when we do research uh, involved with this community and also in different setting as well. Peninsula Malaysia might have different um, factor yeah, uh, compared to Sabah and Sarawak when it comes to doing research. And we would like to also consolidate yeah, a network of co co conversations and collaborations among and between indigenous and non-indigenous experts. What do we expect from this is we want to use three main principles, which is number one is documentations. Documentations meaning that we need to get a right findings, a high, a high quality of data with the indigenous community before we can go to advocate a stage. Yeah? So once we do the advocate stage, then we need to empower the community as well. So it's very important that uh, at the CMS, we want the result or the, out the, the, the output from the project uh, will have significant impacts on the uh, indigenous community as well, right? Okay. So, right, uh, so in terms of the Organization chart. Yeah, this is what I mentioned just now. The latest uh, organization chart I will introduce to the center. So at the moment, uh, we we wanted to involve a, a multidisciplinary researcher uh, as a part of the associate member or member to the center, uh, so that we introduce five main pillars. For instance, the pillars number one is on housing and settlement. Uh, this is very important aspects huh, uh, of, of the uh, research area when it comes to indigenous community because you want to study about the, uh, for instance, affordable housing, about the uh, living environments of indigenous community, about the access uh, to decent housing as well. Yeah, I think this component is often neglected in the literature, uh, so we need to really study the focus on, on, on this expert as well. Yeah? The second pillar is an, on economic and livelihood. Uh, this is where we engage with uh, different researcher, uh, for instance, in the Faculty of Economics to study about the poverty among indigenous community. We want to study about their quality of life. We want to know about their, uh, you know, uh, income level status and also financial literacy among indigenous community. The third pillar is on the health and well-being. This is where we want to know about the health status of the refugee, and no, sorry, of, of the indigenous community. And also, um, we want to, uh, to know, it, you know, I know that in, in, in some countries yeah, where the, the, the center, the, the, the indigenous center is a study about the tropical medicines that has been used by indigenous community. So this is another potential area that can be uh, capture uh, under this pillar as well. So in terms of education, yes, this is very important yeah, uh, among the indigenous community. Uh, you know, we know that there is issue regarding dropout uh, uh, among the, the, the children yeah, of, of the indigenous community. And also the last pillar is on, on the culture, history and society. This is where we need to understand in terms of their belief system for instance how to preserve them you know uh, how to maintain the original language from the uh, this uh, group yeah so so i hope that we, through these five main pillars yeah we can attract a lot of uh, multidisciplinary researcher to join our center yeah uh, okay so what i'm going to do next year is i would find the international and local advisor uh, for the center. So at the moment, yeah, uh, we're still searching and still discussing with some sort of the potential international and local advisor. Uh, of course, yeah, we have our dean uh, as a direct advisor to the center. I also intend yeah, to find the industry advisor. I also have discussion with some industry uh, for them to, to come into the center yeah, uh, to advise us in terms of what kind of directions of our uh, uh, research yeah, that, that will be suitable with the re uh, recent time. Uh, we also need international advisor. It is important to create the visibility of the center, not only locally, but also globally. Yeah? So this is the ongoing. So this is the, the, the plannings for the next year. Uh, 
Okay, so the action plan for 2020, this is just to share what we're going to do next year. Of course, yeah, in terms of that we divided this into four category for the center. We hope we can achieve all of this. Uh, number one is in terms of research and publication. Of course, you cannot run from this. Yeah, so we need to do this like uh, seminar and panel discussions uh, to address various issues related to indigenous community in Malaysia. We have this in the pipeline. Uh, hopefully that we can kick off this uh, seminar next year, start maybe in February next year. Yeah, and we will actually actively engage with multidisciplinary researcher from and outside the UM. Yeah, we hope that yeah, uh, researcher from UM will you know interested to join us in our center to study about indigenous communities. A lot of aspect can be uh, you know study yeah, in relation to this uh, group. And we'll do the community engagement. The second uh, action plan is community engagements. We'll provide a space to display culture artifacts. Uh, we will bring uh, products from the indigenous community into in 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 display it in our office at the CMS office. Uh, we'll plan to do video screening on education on heritage. Uh, as a contribution back to the community and so on. We hope that yeah, the CMS will become a hub as well, not only for the researcher, but for the indigenous students, yeah, so that the indigenous students in UM will have a platform from them to discuss or issues yeah, related with their, maybe the struggle, the challenging or, or the challenges of their daily lives. Yeah? So we, we will create that at, at our office. Uh, income generations, uh, we create uh, indigenous ruang yeah, by CMIS. This is uh, the ruang meaning that we have space where we can rent it to, to the gen public or to the researcher in UM. Yeah? For instance, uh, maybe if the researcher want to do like focus group discussions, so we have that in our office uh, with a very minimal cost yeah, to maintain the building. And we also plan to do indigenous community play market. This is maybe once a month. Yeah, we will invite. Yeah, at the moment I'm planning to invite maybe you know like Borneo market. Yeah, to to uh, during the weekend, for instance. This is for part of the income gener uh, generation as well. Yeah, and the visibility, of course. Yeah, uh, we will do collaborations with other top university. We hope this can be materialized through M MOA and MOU. And also with indigenous community, yeah? we want to work in close, maybe choose one or two community that will clo uh, working closely with our center. I think this is very important on top of the uh, university. Yeah? Uh, we also invite and this industry expert members or affiliation with CMS. This is when I mentioned to uh, just now about the industry advisor. We have identified some of the, the potential industry advisor to be part of our center. Yeah? When talk about industry advisor, it, it, it is uh, the the indigenous community who who already success in industry. Yeah, we have identified some of them actually. Okay. Uh, so again, uh, potential working and engagers, we have identified few continents. We have in contact with them, so hopefully that can be materialized next year. Um, maybe we starting from February. Yeah, because now is quite busy with teaching time. <laughs> So this is the overall strategy for CMS in 2022. Uh, we are really looking yeah, to promote, uh, facilitate a, a lead relevant and ethical research that improve indigenous people well-being. At the end, uh, the output that we want from the center is to improve the indigenous uh, uh, well-being yeah, and also their quality of life. And of course, yeah, through ethical research, uh, we emphasize on this because being an indigenous people myself, I know what the things that you can do and cannot do in the community. So you really need to know uh, the methodology, the right methodology when it comes to the indigenous community. Yeah? So we also yeah, improve the visibility of the, the center through extensive engagement with various stakeholders. This is also in the pipeline at the moment. Uh, we promote uh, community-based research through a symbiotic relationship yeah, between students, researcher, public and private sector, and community members who are interested in indigenous well-being in, in uh, research. We hope we will create this uh, healthy symbiotic relationship, not only between the researcher, but between the activists as well, who are you know, doing a lot of work on the ground related to indigenous community. We will support 
the engagement of students, community members, and researchers in all aspects of the research process, including publication, authorship, and conference presentation. So we hope that we, the CMS can become a platform in UM to support researchers uh, in terms of, you know, maybe uh, in doing research uh, in, in the research process. Yeah? And this is something that quite big that I intend to do, hopefully, when the center getting, getting bigger. We want to uh, nurture and yeah, mentor the next generations of indigenous researchers, especially indigenous faculty who are members of the center. Yeah? This is something that we can do in the long term run uh, when the center become more visible in the eyes of stakeholder and also the outsider. Okay. So these are the list of past activities that has been conducted by the previous head, Dr. Willin, eh, during uh, the MCO. Yeah? I think she quite a uh, she, she's very active eh, in, in doing a lot of activities during that time. For instance, in January 2020 on Orasli, yeah, preserving the right, and invited Shak Koyo and also addressing the, the rights of headspace again, Rohingya refugees and, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of past activities that has been conducted and we are at the center also planning to do a you know, um, monthly seminar, but this will be kick off eh, starting next year. So we, we hope that we can contribute more in term activities and engage with uh, indigenous, directly engage with the indigenous community as well. Yes. I think that's all from me today. So for further information, please visit us at cmis.um.edu.my or you can email us at cms.um.edu.my. So my tagline for today is leave no one behind. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peter. That's very enlightening. Um, all the information that that was shared with us. Uh, I hope you can stay on with us because uh, I know there are a few questions from uh, the, the crowd and I can see Dr. Mans nodding her head. I'm sure she has questions she wants to ask too. Uh, so please do stay on with us. Uh, all right, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vita. Um, without further ado, let me uh, introduce the second speaker, Dr. IR, uh, IR Dr. Mas Shahidayana Mokhtar. She's the head for UM Center for Integrated STEM Exploration or UM STEM. Um, she graduated from U University of Malaya with a Bachelor in Biomedical Engineering in 2004 and followed uh, by a Master's in Biomedical Engineering in 2007, then received a PhD in 2012 from University of New South Wales, Australia in the area of telehealth. Uh, she is very much involved in with various science, technology, engineering and mathematics uh, projects as well as research and programs. She served as the head for UM Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics or STEM Centre since 2018 until now. And she is uh, very much involved in all the various projects. She is the coordinator for the My STEM Ambassador Program under the Ministry of Higher Education mostly STEM mentor mentee and STEM mini theater under the National STEM Association and coordinator for Samsung Solve for Tomorrow competition. She's also one of the evaluators for my biomedical engineering program under the Engineering Accreditation, Accreditation Council. Um, so without further ado, over to you, Dr. Mas. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, are you able to hear my voice? Yes, yes, we are. All right, great. So I'll be sharing my screen. Hopefully I can. Okay. Am I? Oh, maybe I should just share the. Okay. Uh, you can see my screen, right? Okay, great. So uh, we are kind of like a new center. Uh, is is just born in 2018. We call uh, is a uh, UM STEM Center. Okay, if uh, the physical location is we are located at the HIR building, ground floor, next to the um, Bank Islam. Okay, so please do come and visit us. Okay, so um, what I I just give some introduction. So because like people are always talking like uh, it's actually okay. Our centers is a bit different because. It is being initiated because there's an uh, there's a pressing issues in uh, nationwide and I think it's uh, global where like students when they in their secondary schools they kind of like not choosing the science stream. 
So uh, the number of sciences class are dropping. And for example, like uh, in last 10 years, we have two or three science class, but now maybe left with one or maybe none of the sciences class. So what happened is uh, it's not producing enough feeders to the higher education. So um, then uh, it has uh, kind of like triggered the uh, establishment of UM STEM Center. Uh, it started from the Ministry of Higher Education. They, uh, they have a national STEM movement and we come up with proposals. And at that time, together with uh, uh, Academic Science Malaysia and so on, so uh, we developed uh, the center under the umbrella of University of Malaya it, and it's part under the uh, Research and Innovations uh, TNC. So what we believe, um, because like, uh, uh, but since because we are from UM, so we are not looking onto the only the enrollment in STEM itself, because we are looking at the overall aspect or holistic aspect of it. So what we believe, like every young individual, they should have access to the education, especially in STEM. So that's what had happened to our uh, like uh, generations because their interest in STEM because they are only talking because uh, we got a period of time where they have been told that science subjects are very difficult to learn, very difficult to pass and so <laughs> so they don't kind of like choose that and then like they see that if you are becoming a uh, it's good to have a become a business in, in the business uh, line but uh, they can get like uh, like you know fast money and so on like now even now we have all this uh, gig economy and so on so uh, all these are the challenges that we have to face and on top of that uh, in order for them to see that stem science technology engineering and maths are uh, something that uh, not only like useful as in uh, study or subjects uh, so we have to kind of like cultivate, uh, we have to tell them like these are the skills or values that they need to have in order for them to, uh, you know, uh, be success in their future and evolve. So um, we, uh, we wanted them to embrace STEM. So in terms of the knowledge, the new research, the concepts and any relevant skills that we can uh, like embed into this, not only the school student, the university student and also later on, I'll be sharing our pathway until after they graduate. Okay, uh, so what we believe every child is unique, therefore the education should be also. So we have, in order for us to sustain the child's STEM talent, we must provide some alternative where child children can enjoy the learning, especially in STEM, because we don't want to, like, we want to kind of like separate the tagging like STEM is so difficult from uh, our young generation. Uh, so that's why we are looking at how this can be embedded on a various level uh, so they can uh, learn STEM and learn uh, in a fun way and they love doing it. Okay, we are just born in 2018. Okay, so this is our structure. Uh, so uh, we are under the Deputy Vice Chancellor under the Social Advancement and Happiness Research Cluster. We have our advisories, Professor Dr. Dr. Noraini and Professor Dr. Dr. Jamil. And we have uh, our deputy, my deputy is from Dr. Hidayah from Education Faculty and Dr. Manu from PASUM. And my research officer is Shazila. And of course, we have our project coordinators and STEM uh, representative from each of the faculty. Uh, we have international internal linkages and so on. Okay, let me... Do I am, am I able to uh, because my face is in the middle of the presentation, right? <laughs> I don't know why. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, I move it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have like international and external, uh, internal, internal and external STEM linkages. Uh, of course, with the MCAS, Chitra, HEPA, and so on. Okay. Okay, uh, when we say like we have the representative, uh, they are being appointed uh, directly uh, under the, uh, from the dean of uh, our cluster, where we actually like our representative not only coming off from the, from the sciences or technical faculty, uh, we also like uh, have a representative from the faculty of economics and administrations. Uh, we have from uh, English language from Academy of Islamic Studies, uh, Sports and Medicine, Media and Communication Studies and so on. So it's across because it's not only we are talking about STEM that is like, like the hardcore or technical STEM that we are looking at, but it's across the field. Okay. 
So we have three objectives. So our first objective is to promote STEM, STEM education. So uh, by saying promoting, we have uh, three main uh, pillar. We have in terms of the publication where we have collaborated with uh, PASUM uh, for the international STEM journals, and we uh, assist uh, all the our researchers and so on to help them to publish STEM related publications where we have the proceedings, where we have the guidelines book for the Ministry of Higher Education, where we have the modules that being developed by the researchers and on top of that we have the bulletins and as most uh, some of our researchers they, they really love publishing in the you know, magazine like BBP and so on. So we provide them the venue towards that. And of course, we are supporting any STEM related education like involved by the students, community, school, researchers and so on. Okay, um, just before uh, the PK, uh, you know, the MCO, I think we invited quite a lot of like uh, our own very own UM researchers uh, to have a session with the students or the, the children. Uh, we call it STEM discovery. Uh, where we trans we kind of like wanted them to tell the children in a plain um, manners that oh what I'm doing is very nice so I we kind of like invite quite a number of people we invite like from the mushroom uh, later maybe I'll invite Dr. Peter <laughs> to share the knowledge and so on so we can bring this to the school uh, students so this is um but this is quite small. Uh, there's a lot of sessions, so a lot is across. We have the sports science people, we have the, uh, from the medicine, we have across uh, the board where the, uh, the lecturers join us and, you know, really uh, like engage with the students. Okay. Then uh, we have a second objective where we have to play our role as the coordinators, focal point and gathering platform, not only for the government, education industries, academia and stakeholders in the various disciplines of STEM. And uh, on this, that's why I think uh, we are the official like coordinator for the MyStem Ambassador Program. Means we are coordinating all the 20 IPTAs uh, public universities in, in Malaysia under the Ministry of Higher Education. So under the program of MyStem Ambassador, where the audience or the target beneficiaries are actually the, our undergraduate students who regardless they enroll in uh, technical sciences or any field of studies in the universities. And this year they are going to expand it to the private universities and also to the polytechnic and college community. On top of that, um, uh, this is our, will be the last year for the mostly STEM mentor mentee because I think the role of uh, this, uh, they have passed it to the KPM. Uh, so we have uh, engaged with other universities uh, to have this mentor mentoring program. Okay, and we are the, this is already two years now, we are the expert consultant for the Samsung Software Tomorrow uh, because they are doing this STEM competition uh, for a uh, nationwide and we are the secretariat for the National STEM Association where we kind of like help them to do the mini theater STEM under the state's government. Uh, now this, uh, it has been um, under the Selangor State, Kedah and Kelantan State. And we also, for the international competition, we are the collaborator for the BIEA STEM uh, competition uh, UK, uh, in UK. And this year, we are very proud because like uh, quite a number of uh, Malaysian schools actually like won in this competition. And our third objective is uh, our, we are supporting other educators and researchers in STEM-related projects. So uh, we have uh, eight MOU at uh, up to date and we have three international linkages, government linkages and we have more than 20 stakeholders and collaborators. Okay, so uh, as uh, the, the now the one that kind of like um, uh, very uh, uh, big things that we are doing now is the uh, together with the ILO, International Labour Organization, where they wanted to embed the STEM generic skills among the TVET trainees. So we are conducting a project with them and this is the Samsung competition that we are doing. And we have uh, another company or actually like uh, we have engagement with uh, Punaraju where they are training all the teachers under the IPG. So we are now actually like attending uh, across Malaysia for the teachers 
uh, to actually like uh, give them lectures what are the integrated stems and so on and these teachers as uh, sometimes they are not the uh, science maths or rbt teachers they are uh, bahasa melayu teachers bahasa english teachers even pendidikan islam and pendidikan jasmani and so on so because what we are trying we are, we are, what we are trying to do is like you want to embark the interest of stem you cannot just rely on the science or math teachers it has to be across the box uh, so it's not like people won't see like just they are going to see that stem is a bit aliens okay so uh, these are all the activities that we have conducted in, in 2021 uh, is uh, most of it are virtual uh, but some of it actually yesterday we just have a, a program at IPG Nilai because now they already open that we can do some hybrid mode. So some of it we do hybrid mode. Okay, uh, but this one just before the MCO, the one that if you see the kids and so on, just before the MCO, we managed to conduct some of the physical activities. Okay. All right, okay. Uh, so we just wanted to uh, say that uh, because uh, when normally when people are talking about STEM, they always like just think about the schools, and the students and how to ensure that the curriculum, the teaching and so on. But what we are doing is more than that, we wanted to build an ecosystem for the University of Malaya itself. Uh, because once we got our own researchers, because we are, we have a lot of experts in UM, right? I think we are at top, we have the, all the expertise uh, in UM. What we are doing is that we engage with the experts to tone down uh, whatever like a research that we have as in a module that can be understand either by the primary or the secondary school student. So that's what we are doing. We're helping them to develop the module. So this module can be uh, shared with the school's level and also the teacher's level. So um, uh, that's one, that's one part. And then the second part is like, we don't want to do a one stop like a competition and so on with the student. So for example, uh, after they completed the Samsung Song for tomorrow last year, we take the three winners to three schools to embark with us uh, with the support of UMI's office uh, where we have this uh, program STEM at Innovate in UM. So we help the student together with their mentors is actually the lecturers. So we have three lecturers mentoring three teams uh, to help them to uh, enhance whatever idea that they have or they propose to, uh, during the competition to make it, uh, you know, some, some pattern or commercialize and so on. So that same goes to other program as well, mini theater and so on. So that's why we have uh, this year, just this, uh, this year, I think, uh, like early this year, we just opened our business unit under the UMCIC. So then we can move forward uh, for a larger scale of program. So then on top of that, uh, for the STEM research, uh, because we are combining all the researchers uh, together with us. Uh, so I think uh, recently we just embarked into this Jawi STEM. Uh, because uh, we have the researchers coming from the Academy Pengajian Islam, they wanted uh, to to kind of like um, re, not reintroduce, like to um, memperkasa the, the, the Jawi uh, writing, but in terms of uh, the STEM knowledge. So that's what we are doing. So uh, the, let's go to my mislab is our, our uh, this is very close to our heart because it started from uh, before the center has started because it started from us, uh, groups of researchers coming from biomedical engineering where when we bring our children to the labs and kind of like um, teach them, not teach them, uh, like uh, expose them to whatever activities that we have in the labs. Uh, so now we are talking about the integrated STEM. This is the thing that we are talking to all the IPG teachers right now. And this is the My Esther Ambassador, which is the program under the uh, Ministry of Higher Education. Okay, so uh, we have a kind of like envision a pathway. Uh, so we don't want the student to be one off program with uh, when they because most of the time when they enroll, they, they enter the competition is one off, then they win, then, then it's, it's that. So th that's why we, um, we redesign this framework of the pathway. So, uh, for example, like uh, it's based on our own program. For example, if as early as four to eight years old, if they join out of the Let's Go to Mommy's Lab, we are going to follow up with them with another program when uh, at their age of nine to 12 and so on and so forth. And even now, what we've done, okay, maybe uh, 
because we are just in 2018, right? So uh, they are still young. So maybe they are only at this age or this age. But at any stage here, we already have the students that join us. So for example, we have this MySTEM ambassador students across the 20 IPTAs. So these students, we've got the KPT PIVs coming to, from the Ministry of Higher Education. Um, we uh, So they are going to be upskilled on if they are not coming from the STEM background, uh, they are going to enroll into an upskilling program and they are go going to get like a confirmed uh, placement in the industries. So uh, it's kind of like across the boards that when we're talking about the pathway with us, the UM STEM centers, and we are um, uh, like uh, have been doing this as the coordinating uh, unit for across uh, the, the ministries, the government, the private and so on. Okay. Um, but uh, this one is uh, the thing also uh, we just I just talked to <laughs> the DVC of uh, research because if you can see ours is like across the board. So uh, even though our center is under the research and innovation, um, we are also engaging with our academic uh, DVC. Uh, a lot of time like uh, the DVC of academic help us and we are also engaged with the DVC for the value creation enterprise. So we, <laughs> uh, we are kind of like mix and match all this and also plus of course the student affairs uh, so because a lot of undergraduate students involved with our STEM programs so we are across the board when we are talking about STEM so I think that's uh, for for some introduction about my center so uh, if uh, okay and we encourage to all the uh, researchers or lecturers who are interested to join us so we will invite you to share your knowledge with the student uh, so please register your interest if you would like to become the speakers uh, for your Amsterdam Center. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mas. That's very, very inspiring listening to the UM STEM Center. And I can also already see many collaborations with Dr. Yeah. Peter uh, yes. with regards to the indigenous population, especially on yeah. the education component where you talked about the informal education of STEM which mm. I think it, it's um, something that maybe uh, some collaborations can be done after this session. So thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, right. Actually, I, I have a list of questions that I want to talk to. to, talk to <laughs> okay, so, we, shall, so, we shall reserve the list of questions to us. So. <laughs> of course, I think it's with Prof Zurina also. <laughs> Okay. okay, cool. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mas. So without further ado, let me introduce to you the last but not least, Professor Dr. Zurina Osman. She's the head for Center for Ionix University of Malaya, CIUM. Um, she graduated uh, with PhD from UMC Malaya in 2003. Her research interest focuses on energy materials, particularly polymer, electrolytes and electrode materials, which are used in electrochemical devices such as batteries solar cells and supercapacitors. She joined as a lecturer at physics department in 2003, promoted to associate professor in 2008 and as a pro professor in 2018. And she has been involved in various administrative positions at the faculty level as well as the university level. And currently she's the head of department for physics department, faculty of science, uh, University of Malaya. Since 2018, she has been appointed as the head of center for Ionix uh, University of Malaya, CIUM and she has published more than 70 research papers in high-ranked journals having more than 800 citations and a H index of 14. And she has presented various research papers in many international national conferences and, post and supervised more than uh, 30 postgraduate students. So without further ado, all, uh, over to you, Professor Dr. Zarina Osman. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much to Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Nora Nakia as uh, the very nice introduction and also chairing the session. And Assalamualaikum, a very good morning to all. So I think I, I will share the slide. Okay, uh, I I hope everyone can see my slide. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Okay, and also not to forget, thank you to the Research Cluster uh, Office for organizing this event. And firstly, I would like to introduce myself. I am Zurina Osman, uh, currently uh, since 2018, um, appointed as the head of center for IONIS, or it, we can call as a CIUM, or sometimes people call as a TUM. 
So uh, our center situated uh, in Department of Physics, University of Malaya. So actually, uh, this center uh, was established by uh, Professor Dr. Abdul Karim in 2018, uh, where uh, he was the head until uh, 2018 and uh, he was retired in 2019 and now uh, he is the honorary professor in our department. So actually our research center is the uh, research center that concentrate on the research that related to the ionic materials or uh, we can say that it is uh, related to the field of uh, material science. Our vision uh, to be a world-class center of excellence for ionic research and our mission to achieve excellence in promoting and conducting research in area of ionics and related field uh, and also to undertake uh, the high quality multidisciplinary and also uh, collaborative research and to produce well-trained postgraduates at once and innovative research so to uh, disseminate research finding and address national and global challenges also to uh, as a, to value add graduate with with a specific skill knowledge and leadership so these are our uh, team uh, currently we have uh, 14 academic staff uh, which is of, uh, out of that uh, three professors three associate professors and eight seniors uh, lecturers comes from uh, physics department itself, uh, from chemistry departments, uh, Institute Science, uh, Biological Science, and also from uh, Pusat Asasi uh, UM. And also uh, we have uh, two honorary professors, one postgraduate, uh, postgraduate uh, one research officer, and two uh, lab staff. So these are the detail of the our members. So currently I am the head and uh, associate professor Dr. Zuhazi is the deputy head. For Ramesh, for Siti Rohana, for, uh, associate professor Dr. Ramesh Kasi, Dr. Hamdi, Dr. Wu, Dr. Faris uh, uh, from uh, biology, uh, Dr. Faridah, Dr. Izlina, Dr. Uh, Zaina Abidin, Dr. Nushafiza, Dr. Siti Norfahana and Dr. Ahmad Daniel from Pusat Asasi Science. And here is a honorary professor, Professor uh, Dr. Abdul Karim, and also Professor Dr. Rosah Yahya from Chemistry. And uh, we have Dr. Shahid as a postgraduate, and uh, Dr. Muhammad Ziauddin as research officer. Okay, uh, we also collaborate. Uh, international and also at uh, in national level in international uh, our collaborators come from France uh, Portugal Uzbekistan Japan Sri Lanka and also India and uh, not to and also uh, Indonesia and uh, in international national level uh, we collaborate uh, with the most of the local universities such as uh, UITM UPNM UPM and also a few uh, private universities and this we also uh, collaborate with the industry so uh, these are from uh, IMP um, at Limor, uh, Lembaga Timah Malaysia and also Chris Okay, about our uh, center, uh, so far we have, uh, CIUM has published uh, more than 400 uh, ISI cited journals and also produce uh, more than uh, 50 PhD and uh, more than 40 master's uh, holders and uh, listed in, in this slide now is the uh, current or the latest uh, publication from 2018 to 2020. So uh, it's about, uh, we, we publish about 30 to 40 ISI uh, papers each year. And also uh, these are the numbers of the active uh, postgraduate students. And these are the research grant. We, we obtain uh, research grant from national, international, as well as from industry. 
and these are the about the research focus a few of the some of the our research here which is uh, some of us work on the polymer electrolytes on the electro materials on the pigment and coatings and about the device uh, some of us working on the rechargeable batteries in lithium batteries magnesium batteries sodium batteries supercapacitors capacitors and also uh, solar cells so these are our activities from 2019 uh, to 2020 and of course that uh, uh, due to the pandemic COVID-19 is a, a quite limited our activities and but uh, that's not uh, we, we not stop our activity even though uh, in 2020 we, we have a workshop online workshop and also it is quite um, the participant is, is quite uh, okay and then uh, this actually house that we generate income to our center and uh, these activities uh, uh, including MOU, MOA, and also uh, we uh, organize workshop, uh, conferences, uh, joining uh, exhibition, and uh, not to forget that we also have the uh, community engagement, and this KLESF actually uh, organized by STEM, and then we, we joined this in 2019. And also, uh, we have actually every two years we have our conference uh, that we call as an international conference on functional materials, and uh, we we are going to uh, have uh, this as ICFMD in 20, next year, inshallah, in 2022, and not. Uh, only about the uh, activities we also offer uh, services uh, such as the testing of the um, materials that uh, use the FTIR, the MA and also uh, we offer uh, the test battery testing measurement in our laboratory to uh, fabricate the uh, battery especially for lithium battery and uh, not uh, about uh, this uh, our services we also be a place uh, for uh, industrial training uh, student from the local university such as from uh, UMP, UITM, UPM and uh, that's all I think thank you very much Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Dr. Zurina Osman. That was very interesting listening to what the uh, CIUM has been doing and of course the research achievements, even though during pandemic, it seems that uh, the achievements still go on. So Alhamdulillah and congratulations to you. Um, maybe um, for the next session is the Q&A session. So for any of the participants who would like to ask questions, um, you may put on your mic or uh, video and or raise your hand and just ask questions or alternatively you can also type in the questions at the chat box and I'll read out the questions to you. Um, maybe I'll open the floor right now so anyone with questions? Maybe you can start with Dr. Mas. I know she has questions <laughs> for Dr. Peter. <laughs> yeah, both actually. Okay, thank you, Prof. Noran. Okay, uh, to Dr. Peter. Okay, I think later we will need to communicate next year, lah, not this year. Because, uh, for example, what they've been doing in Philippines, uh, especially on the curriculum of STEM, because uh, I think we know that Philippines, a lot of this in, uh, indigenous and, and like, right? Like, uh, so, so they have a different languages. They have different way of learning STEM and so on. So we can start that with your centers because I saw like you already have the pillar of curriculum there. So so later next year, I'll, I'll keep in touch with you. This year, of course, we are busy with teaching. And uh, untuk Prof Zarina, actually kan, is it possible? Uh, tapi nanti pun next year lah Prof. Uh, we are trying to introduce all those high-end machines to the teachers. So much up if we can do a video just showing that introdu introducing and then there's a simple way of using the machine so it will be good so we can share with the teachers so they are aware that oh okay these are the equipments that when the student are grow up get the universities the high-end type of equipment because i see like you have a lot of fancy equipments <laughs> so jealous <laughs> It's so nice. Okay. Okay. So I think that's the two things that i think uh, that's thank you very much for the call so then we can collaborate on this Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Mas. Uh, yeah, I think uh, this 
is one of the most fruitful <laughs> UMCOR sharing session where we immediately linked up and plan for activities next year. <laughs> terus, terus dapat. Okay, I've got questions for, for all the three speakers. Maybe I'll start on uh, with um, Dr. Peter, right? So with regards to, you mentioned um, activities done by your centre, especially during the lockdown, uh, the hard lockdown we had, MCO 2020. So um, how has the indigenous population actually respond to this pandemic? I, I do know from uh, from the teachings that I do, as well as the activities in public health that we do, where we go down to the community. And I, I do know that there's some uh, indigenous pop, uh, communities, um, they have their own terms when you talked about pandemic, like Hawa, right? For example, or how we, when you talk about plague, plague, sorry. So uh, how, how have they been responding to the pandemic um, up until now? Do you know? Uh, okay, thank you, Prop. Uh, actually, the, the activities that I show you just now is was conducted by the previous head. Yeah? It was in 2020. I mentioned my appointment was August this year. Yeah? But uh, in response to your question, based on my own experience from housing and settlement perspective, because I'm in the urban planner professions, yeah? urban studies profession, uh, in terms of housing settlement, for instance, uh, in Sabah, I'm talking from this, in my case study area in Sarawak, yeah, in long houses, during the pandemic, they actually barricade their own area where outsiders are not allowed to enter their communities, that number one. Number two is that those who are living in the small town, they move back to the long houses because they, they are afraid of the COVID-19. So basically, they move back to long houses. The current situation now is that the long house is quite empty out of 30, 40 family, for instance, only five families still living there, right? Like my said, already migrated out from the towns. But during the COVID-19, the trend was that those who living in the, the small town, they cannot going back to the Kampong Bali. So that's a really nice pattern. So that's why when it involves indigenous community, I think researchers need to understand the uh, settlement morphology. We use the morphology changing over time, how it's influenced the indigenous community as a whole. But uh, that one from my uh, case study area, but in gender, I think for those who vulnerable group, yeah, not only uh, indigenous group in, in, in Sarawak, but I believe that they are badly affected by the COVID-19, yeah, pandemic COVID-19. In fact, in terms of vaccination rate as well among the indigenous community, especially or Asli, there was an issue where the vaccination, vaccination rate is quite low among them. That's why actually uh, the, the ministry, yeah, I think they they, they they doing some sort of awareness about the importance of vaccine, vaccine yeah, COVID-19 vaccines to the indigenous community. But I still believe that that's why I think the, the pillar that I introduced to the center is kind of like you look at into multidisciplinary. Uh, so I think one this discipline, we cannot work in silo, yeah. Uh, everybody from different expertise need to work together. The indigenous is only the, the, the group, the focus group of the research, but the, the core of the research is that how to improve their well-being, how to improve their quality of life. Yeah, I think that that's my response, Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peter. I, I do agree with you. Um, leaving no one behind is not just a tagline that we say, but it must be something that we do. Yeah. And uh, it has to be something. I, and I think a lot of our, our researchers are actually passionate about the, the concept of SDG. And uh, the intrinsics of the population is very important before you actually try to embark on programs or research. And we need to understand the intrinsics rather than just impose what we feel that they should do. Yeah, I, I do agree with your with your response and I look forward to 2022 Two. for a better <laughs> 2022 so that yeah. uh, we can we can move forward our, our agenda. Thanks, mm -hmm. Dr. Peter. Um, I've got a question for Dr. Zurin, uh, Prof. Zurina. Um, with uh, your centre uh, achieving a lot of um, good uh, research uh, uh, outputs, right? So. Um, what what do you think are the impact of COVID-19 restriction on the research environment and motivation? And looking forward to 2022, uh, maybe you can share with us some of the challenges and plans that Centre does to mitigate these issues. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Prof. Nuran. So, yeah, yeah, actually, our center also uh, affected actually with this uh, pandemic because um, you know that uh, we are science based and hangs on uh, the experiment, even though my postgraduate student also affected because uh, kejap buka, kejap tutup, boleh masuk lab, tak boleh masuk lab. Kan? So, but then we, we need to. Uh, it's a bit struggle uh, a bit and then and then at this time also I B H O D and then it's, it's very uh, tough uh, and mister <laughs> the, the, the work actually the need to be done but uh, we, we have uh, find the alternative uh, such as that uh, even though uh, we, we need to do online so it, we, we managed to get uh, some income through that workshop uh, that we do. So even though uh, normally uh, we do it face to face, then of course that workshop uh, hands on in the lab and also plus with the thought. But due to the pandemic, so we just do it uh, um, uh, online, fully online. But uh, we invite our collaborator, not only from our expertise. So we do invite our collaborator from Japan, uh, from India, Sri Lanka, and also from uh, Indonesia. So uh, that's the, the, the way how we do it. And then now we're thinking of uh, doing our, uh, every uh, two years we do the, our international uh, conference, but now uh, that's a time that we need to do by next year. So we we still um, under uh, discuss this whether we want to do it uh, online or face to face because thinking about the border. So our aim actually uh, international participants. So that's maybe we will go for fully online <laughs> next year. So uh, and then also. Uh, Thanks to uh, Professor Karim, actually, because um, this center actually uh, established by him in 20, uh, 20, uh, 2007. And actually, Prof. Karim has started the collaboration with uh, most of the international collaborators. So what I uh, doing now and, and we as a member, we just we continue and uh, enhance actually uh, if our contact we have our own contact and then we we do the mou or mmoa and also uh, actually uh, very uh, thank you so much to our, all of the members uh, because they are actively uh, uh, join um, even though uh, during pandemic we are actively join uh, conferences and also exhibition yes so I suppose uh, masa work from home tu, it's never stop lah. It, it doesn't mean work from home, it's work never stops, yeah, right? Stop, so no. even, though, even though we were under lockdown or all the restrictions, everything still goes on as, as usual. So we wish you all the best for your conference, maybe a hybrid conference or like you said, a fully online conference would be the way forward because yeah, we, yeah, we, we, we don't see <laughs> we don't see the, the borders or, or even if the borders are open, there's so many... Um, different uh, criteria or guidelines that people would have to adhere to that it, it, it can become a bit messy, right? Yes, so I yes, suppose no. conferences or webinars uh, linking internationally is either hybrid or fully online. And that, that seems to be the way forward. Lah. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, Dr. Mas, ada soalan. Um, since you're into telehealth, that's your uh. area of expertise. <laughs> okay, um, yes. Again, back to COVID-19, right? Um, one of the things that we we at least this year is is much better than last year okay, last year we were dealing with the unknown so from the whole of 2020 we kind of got to know the virus and understood the virus a bit and uh, we have a lot of uh, what you call uh, strategies that we can use right but majority of the strategies are actually uh, behavioral interventions but in the non-pharmacological intervention, social distancing or physical distancing, mask wearing, um, ventilation, because we now know that the virus is actually airborne, so ventilation issues that require people to behave in a certain way, right? So avoid crowd areas. So how do you see uh, these decision uh, or decision tools that can be modified using telehealth uh, methods? 
is there any you know ideas that we can we can use because oh, yeah uh, okay actually like i think they have um um i we just spoke uh, we have had our conference okay this is now like a bit on the biomedical engineering but actually like i'm, I'm going to relate with that because we also have conducted some workshop on virus hunters among the students so they from early they have to know about the virus and so on and also the vaccines okay um but i think on top of that uh, okay they've tried have done the trial in ophelia just recently where they are using all these uh, telehealth devices, uh, monitoring from home. So uh, then what they, I think, but of course, like, uh, it's going to be uh, uh, like um, more works to be done because it has to be uh, getting the government support in order for it to be translated across the government hospital, kan? Uh, but I think they have done in uh, like us, lab, like uh, at hospital universities, uh, three universities, if not, I'm mis mistaken. What they've done instead of... Um, because I think at one time, we kind of like two packed with people at the hospitals, right? So I, th I, th I, th I think even PPM, they even closed the door for <laughs> at one period of time. Yeah, I, I remember at that time because uh, that's very, very uh, pressing. I think you even close the door for others and you are like putting all your other patients to other hospitals. <laughs> I remember that. Uh, so uh, what they've done, uh, so, so I, uh, they, they take the... Um, the non severe like maybe one and two like them okay uh, they are putting at home uh, but just self monitoring uh, but that one also we can give them some devices what we have now the uh, now i think most of the uh, people in malaysia they buy these uh, pulse oximetry uh, they measure themselves but if we have these telehealth devices so we can also monitor from at the hospital level and but they also do they take away the level 3 I mean, like you only handle four and five where the one that really, really need the ventis and so on. Level three, and they really put all the equipments at home and they do the monitoring from home. So they've done, I think, in three hospitals, if I'm not mistaken, and they've done for the COVID uh, patients. So, uh, but, I, uh, but of course, I then we ask, because uh, that's his, uh, my previous supervisors in Australia. So, of course, there's a uh, challenges lah, because in order to convince the government to make this as uh, you know the norm among all the hospitals across the government and so on, that's a uh, challenges lah. But at least what they can do is one, they can reduce the number of patients that you have to put in the hospitals. Second, they are reducing the cross infection. Because you're only dealing directly with the device with less intervention with the nurses, less intervention with the doctors. So uh, that's the things that I think when we're talking about telehealth, they are they are moving towards that. Right, so right, uh, but, yeah. <laughs> but on top of that, just uh, mentioning like uh, the, we just uh, conducted for the Selangor and KL for the student to know about their vaccines for the school student. If not, uh, we have these challenges at one time. Well, when the government introduced the vaccines to these um, 12 to 17 years old, right? And you know, like uh, these students, because they are sometimes they involved with us in the program, they contacted us, can we don't take the vaccine? And they really are, they are afraid and all, all the, you know, all this is so they are not aware about the benefit and uh, the side effect and so on. So we kind of like have some really general engagement to, to, to explain to them and at least they are aware that it is important for them to take the vaccines. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mas. I, I like the two points that you make. One is the mm. virus hunters. That's really cool. That really sounds very interesting <laughs> and I'm sure uh, it, it really, you know, gets people's attention. And and the other one was the fact that your, uh, your mentees who came to you still reach out to you. So I think that's very important when you can have that open channel and they know who they, they are able to reach out to the, the, the proper people because uh, uh, we know sometimes among teenagers um, being, you know, getting information from social media, which might not be the actual person to give them the proper advice. So that's that's really interesting to, to note. Uh, again, congratulations to your center. That, that's really good. Dr. Peter, I've got one question for you. Um, again, uh, with regards to COVID-19, what are the ways that you can frame messages uh, with regards to the vulnerable population? How do we how do we get this message across? What, what kind of strategies do you think works? <laughs> that that's quite a difficult question, Prof. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the actual the actual question because if 
we can have a lot of message, we can have a lot of uh, information. Tapi kalau populasi tu uh, either they don't understand or the way we say it is not appropriate to to the way they receive it, then uh, it just the communication just breaks down, right? Yeah. So I think as you know, as I explained earlier, kind in the background, different type of indigenous people looking into the vaccination rate. I think in Sarawak, there is no problem among indigenous community. Sarawak show very high vaccination rate in the country. But I think maybe among orang asli, uh, there should be an awareness yeah, on the ground, maybe from Jakwa to do aggressive, uh, not to say promotion, but how the importance, the importance of the, the, the vaccines to curb the spread of COVID-19, I think that's very important. It can be done through social media as well. I uh, know, but it, it's quite tricky in certain area that, you know, for instance, in my kampong as well, even the, you cannot get TV3 punya siaran pun, then even though you promote it through social media, it's will not going to reach the populations, right? Uh, it, I think the government need to do more creative way to do it. They really need to go to the ground. Uh, like, you know, in, if not mistaken, yeah, in, in Sarawak, they bring the vaccine to the center, to the community, rather than the community bring a go to come to the PPB. So I think that would be more effective if the you know the relevant agency actually comes to the crown, not only promoting about the importance of vaccine, but they do it on the ground straight away. Yeah, I think that that's that's one of the way that we can do it about it. Yeah. So, 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 so Sarawak's uh, approach was to actually bring the vaccine down to the population yeah. and ensuring that the trust is there so then the population comes in and actually yeah. gets the vaccine. Right, so, so that's, yeah, that, that's very interesting. Yeah, maybe for the other uh, areas, uh, that should also be the way to get them to, to get the vaccine or to, to at least yeah. you know, get, get themselves vaccinated. Thanks, thank you so much. Um, Prof Zurina, I think one last question to you. Um, apa ni, when it comes to research and COVID-19, uh, you mentioned buka tutup, buka tutup was very difficult for the students to come in, the PhD students, the master students to do their research, I mean to do their lab work. Uh, how, how do they overcome this? I mean, what, what, what strategies uh, did you do to actually manage for them to manage to overcome this issue? Okay, uh, Prof, uh, thank you for the question. So for myself and uh, for my student, I have a few PhD and also master student where they have to do um, electrodes and also fabricate a battery, which is, uh, of course, they need to come to the lab. But uh, what I uh, ask them to do during this pandemic cannot go to the lab. So what they have before, because Buka tutup, buka tutup. So yeah. uh, sometimes when, when the kids uh, increase and then I ask uh, them to be prepared to copy all the data and then you you take home the data and bring back your laptop and do analysis. And also you must read journal, do the literature and also uh, papers, uh, write papers and also uh, those who already uh, at the fourth office semester, they need to uh, write up the, the, the thesis. So that, that's what, what I did. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks, Prof. I think that's a very good uh, advice, actually, for those yeah, the beginning part, so they can read up in the literature and actually can come up with narrative reviews or systematic reviews or, you know, review paper as papers for them to work on their thesis. And for those who already have some data, bring home the data, crunch the data, come up with the uh, results at least, uh, you know, and then, and then the papers as well. So, yeah, I think... Um, for each individual phases of their PhD or masters, they need to be able to uh, maneuver. Apa kita kata maneuver, right? Yeah, but but then, Prof, uh, I think uh, monitoring from supervisor is very important. If you not monitor, they will not do because you know that work from home. And then, so for myself, also for every day, I will contact my uh, postgraduate student so see the progress. Sometimes we do it the uh, Google Meet meeting, online meeting. So constant constant meet with supervisors is also very important. At least yeah. to encourage them, lah. Yeah, I, I can understand challenges of working from home. Uh, besar when you have yeah, childrens yeah. as well as the dapu is always calling. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dapu tu belum 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 masak lagi, so, or the washing machine is calling you to to, to just do the housework. Yeah, it, it can be difficult. True, true. 
So really, we, we do hope that 2021 would be a better year, well, hopefully, um, with at least uh, some, most of us are already vaccinated and the booster dose is coming up. So hopefully people yes, yes. pick up. Yeah, hope so, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Mas, ada soalan lagi satu? Again, this is on data collection masa uh, zaman COVID-19 era. So uh, how how do you do that? I mean, ha have you done any online data collection? Ah, yeah. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's the part that uh, where uh, we kind of like use our biomedical engineering skills into this STEM research center. Because uh, when we do our research, uh, for example, we involve, um, okay, okay. Uh, I'm just giving some example what we've done. Uh, we have developed an AR augmented reality apps for these hepatic cancer cells. Okay, so uh, it's supposed to be like a physical contact where we, um, you know, uh, find enroll the, the the subjects and we do and we measure the EEG and so on. But then we have uh, difficulties. Uh, let me off my video. I don't know why. Okay. Um. Uh, we have the difficulties, of course, at that time, can the student cannot that uh, cannot come and so on. So we have to change because we are looking at the cognitive engagement. So what we've done, we do the online, uh, like uh, online data collection. So where the student they have to turn on their video. So now what we are doing is, uh, we change the methods uh, rather than using the brain signal. We have to do the facial recognition and, uh, yeah, process the facial features when they are looking at the augmented reality apps. So, uh, so that's what we are doing. So, because we have to improvise. If if not, this is it's very hard for us to collect data. So, we have to do the session online where we uh, ask the student to you know uh, you know use the apps and educational modules and so on. And at the same time, we ask them to turn on the video so we capture their videos and images. Uh, so we have to do some processing on that lah. Uh, so that's uh, how we have to improvise. But other than that, other than that scan. Um, but this is coming from not only us lah. Uh, I, I really um, agree what, what Prof Zurina was saying. Okay, it's true we can do all the virtual things tau actually tapi uh, the hands-on especially in STEM is really really in needed. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, what they've done, I think most of the program, even though we do like virtual master MCO, but we still do some hybrid, we still figure out how to pack uh, simple, simple kits, like experiment kits, send it that to the homes of the student, or now because it's just open, then uh, we have to do some small, small group, because uh, that's really a challenge for uh, the school also, because the student, when they don't learn like science, uh, especially science, uh, not hands on, their interest uh, is not really that because I you know like all these things they really need to hold can pegang do the experiment do the measurement so barulah they, they come the you know the, the the interest on that so I think they are they are trying to we still keep like um you know helping uh the MOE and so on lah how how to we can do this rather at least kalau tak boleh full physical pun hybrid ah uh, macam tu. Right, right. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Mas. I think, uh, yeah, uh, some form of stimulation is still needed. Um, mm. I like the visual recognition. I always find when we wear our mouse, our visual recognition too, they're, they're it's hard. You can, you can only see the, the eyes and the, a bit of the nose. So sometimes to recognize people, upon it, you, you kind of like need to look at three, four times, but nevertheless, you can just say hi to anyone. It doesn't really matter again, <laughs> walaupun the visual recognition to terhad. So thank you so much. Um, let me see if there are there any other questions from the participants. Uh, so participants, if you are interested to ask question, you can either write on the chat box ataupun just raise your hand. And we will also like the participants to um, uh, fill up the feedback form for future improvements. Any questions from the participants? Any questions from the speakers? Uh, I have uh, not question to answer, uh, to give feedback from the, the one that uh, asking by Dr. Mas. So about the uh, involvement of a uh, student uh, from school actually we encourage actually because uh, previously we have that actually uh, uh, student from schools uh, involved in our workshop and so on so you, you are welcome most welcome so please contact us thank you 
Okay, thanks, thanks, Prof Zurina. Any, any more? I will contact Prof Zurina as well, and Dr Thomas personally later on to learn <laughs> how to connect with the stakeholder. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, thank you, very, thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Since uh, suddenly we among us who ask question, I'm just asking uh, like uh, Prof Zurina, um, is it like uh, for example like uh, ionic is very I think it's kind of like ion uh, high end uh, type of like uh, skills or knowledge that these students have to have. Uh, but it's like do the industries uh, they open a lot of uh, like employment in this field? Yes, yes. Um, Dr. Mas, uh, actually, ionics is, is that of that material, but uh, we also fabricate device. So, uh, actually, we, we do have a uh, collaborate with the industry that related to device. So, as example, IMP, actually, the one that industry that related to UPS. So, we, we contribute in terms of battery inside their U UPS. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because, because, because uh, what uh, we have now, we have to have a project under the Ministry of Higher Education. Now, teruslah collaboration kan, from Okay. <laughs> because uh, I'm just, I need, I need to, because I think both lah, um, uh, because we wanted to upskill, for example, our undergraduate student yang just completed their engineering ke, physics ke, and so on. For example, if you see like a certain skills that needed by this Ionic Industries UPS, if they have a certain skill that maybe like your center can provide, so we can open like the training and then we can cut like this student already equipped with this uh, specific like training to upskill so they are more uh, uh, relevant to work in your industries. So we can talk on that lah because you can provide the extra or upskilling uh, training to the students, uh, to the graduates, to our yes, graduates. Yes, yes sure. Yeah. In fact, uh, actually, uh, we, we train actually students from UMP, UPM. Mm -hmm. Actually, mm -hmm. a few of them actually uh, do I, uh, CIUM as uh, their uh, industrial training placement. Good, good, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think maybe we can talk on that later dengan Prof. Yes, and also yes. like, uh, yeah, Dr. Peter, kalau if you have like undergraduate students who just finished, who just graduated, who are looking for employment and upskilling, uh, so maybe you can uh, link with us because we have to provide them uh, like Prozurina punya memang very, very high end but ours is like a bit uh, general STEM skills. Uh, so then they can get the employment for this a certain company. Uh. <laughs> right, that sounds so good. <laughs> Very inspiring to see all three connected already. Last question to Dr. Peter. Um, again, this is with regards to COVID-19. I think COVID-19 is uh, actually a very novel infection that uh, to me is going to change a lot of things, especially in medicine and public health and uh, health and well-being. And um, I just, I was just triggered by, um, I was just wondering now that we know COVID-19 is actually airborne, and we also know uh, the route of uh, transmission. Uh, what do you think is going to happen or are there going to be any changes in terms of urban or, or, or uh, regional, I mean, planning, a town planning in a sense? How do we, you know, uh, look into our towns to, to make sure that we coexist together with this virus? Yeah, I think in terms of how do we coexist eh, with the COVID-19, there's a lot of debate at the moment regarding how we plan the city, how we're moving forward from this is, in, for instance, there might there might be might be a new guideline how to use the public spaces, for instance, with certain uh, social distancing measure, right? And also maybe there will be new design of buildings that that embrace natural air, air ventilations, for instance. So I think, you know, in terms of planning the city, yeah, you know, in the next couple of years, maybe, maybe, maybe yeah, the government will look at into the density. One for one particular area is very important. Maybe they will reduce the density to curb any diseases like COVID-19, especially that will involve the airborne. Yeah? But I think at the moment, there's still a lot of going on discussion how to make our city more resilient towards any pandemics by designing the city. So we need to rethink how the traditional way of design the city to embrace uh, or to acknowledge the existence of, you know, this kind of airborne diseases in the future, I think. Yeah, yeah I think I think you're right. Uh, there are a lot of work to be done, uh, especially now that uh, some people call this COVID-19 as a reset button. 
Um, again, uh, you know, living in crowded area is no good. Um, uh, and especially in, in cities like Kuala Lumpur, Petaling Jaya, uh, around the urban areas, uh, suddenly you just see an open space. Lepas tu ada uh, the signboard that says um, apa, menambahkan kepadatan penduduk. <laughs> so, yeah. so those things really need to be rethought and, and see how to how do we go about uh, yeah living in in, uh, in the coming future. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Peter, for your thoughts. I think, um, I think from that, probably just to add on a little bit, judging from this kind of emerging diseases in the city and also in the human settlements, that, that might be or should be, you know, not to say specific research center on vulnerable communities. Indigenous is part of vulnerable communities, but we're looking into those who live in the city center, like, you know, Pipoti, for instance, right? UKM established that Pipoti center, which I think future collaborations, I and mean, maybe could be done to improve the linkages, how to attack address issue related with vulnerable community, right? Not necessary for the indigenous community as only, yeah. Yeah, I do agree with you. The vulnerable communities is one large community that uh, includes a lot. Mm -hmm. the migrant populations, the urban poor, uh, and as well as the indigenous population. So yes, again, going back to the SDG, leaving no one behind is a, is a it should not just be a tagline. It should be something that we are passionate to improve uh, the community. So yeah. It has been a great discussion. Uh, Prof. Steph just put here really inspiring work and plans and good luck to all three centers. Yes, we wish you all the best in 2022 and, uh, and hope that all the linkages um, uh, happens. Inshallah, it will, right? And um, to wrap up the session, I'd like to thank uh, all the three speakers, Dr. Peter Aning, Anak Tadung, uh, IR Dr. Mas Shahidayana Mukhtar, and Professor Dr. Zurina Osman to, for the sharing of uh, your research centers. It has been really interesting morning, and I hope uh, everyone has benefited from this discussion, and we look forward to all the collaborations in 2022. Thank you. Oh, uh, I forgot. I think uh, usually we have a photo session. Yes, ambil gambar. So for everyone, uh, boleh on kan di video and we have a photo session. Okay, ready? One, two, three, smile. Once again, one, two, three, smile. Okay, once again, thank you very much and Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Take thank care. You. Thank you very much. Bye. Have a nice day. And happy new year. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. New year is coming in two weeks time. So happy yeah. new year to all. Okay, thank you. Bye.